Okay. I think uh, I can be heard, I hope. <laughs> and uh, welcome everyone. For all those who've joined us, we're delighted to have you here. This is our second virtual Med Talk event entitled An Acquired Taste, A Story of Fat, the Sexes, and Why Diets Don't Work, presented by the UCF College of Medicine and our own Dr. Tim Gilbertson. My name's Chip Roberts, and I'll be the MC this evening. And uh, I work in the advancement area of the College of Medicine. And before we begin tonight's presentation, I'd like to go over just a few little housekeeping items. Um, so during the presentation, of course, please make sure your microphones are muted. If you have a question during the presentation, please feel free to type that question in the chat box that'll appear at the bottom of your screen. And we'll be sure to go over your questions during the Q&A portion. And you can also ask a question by live by raising your hand during the Q&A portion. So uh, that's it for the housekeeping. And now to the good part. Uh, I'm delighted to introduce you to someone who I think needs no introduction in our community, a physician, an educator, visionary leader, who's built our medical school from the ground up and is our founding dean and has also built the academic or is in the process of building uh, the Academic Health Sciences Center. So our Vice President for Health Affairs, founding dean of the UCF College of Medicine, um, with many, many accolades and, and even is on Wikipedia, I'm pretty sure you can look it up, uh, Dr. Deborah C. German, and I will turn it over to Dr. German. Thank you. Well, thank you, Chip. And as always, you're way too generous. Uh, good evening and welcome everyone to our second virtual UCF Med Talk event, part of our new health symposia series. We're so glad that you've joined us this evening. This series is designed to bring the best research and discovery from our college directly to our community. Now, some of you may be new to the College of Medicine and you may not know about our medical school. So I thought I'd just share a few very basic facts. We were founded in 2006. Our first class started in 2009 and we've enrolled 12 classes of medical students. We're located in Lake Nona. We currently have 489 medical students enrolled. That's 120 per class. And we have over 3,000 undergraduate and graduate students in biomedical sciences. We are also training almost 500 interns, residents, and fellows who are studying in hospitals across Central, Central Florida. Um, we have about 150 employed faculty and many, many volunteer faculty. We have a new teaching hospital and cancer center that will open in early March of 2021. And as most of you know, our faculty are engaged in teaching, caring for patients and in research in many areas of medicine. Now, tonight's presentation is a topic that affects each one of us, taste. We are very excited to have Dr. Gilbertson join us this evening and share a bit of his research and scientific findings as they pertain to food, taste, and particularly the differences uh, among the sexes and why we're drawn to some foods over others. Understanding these factors may help us become healthier uh, as an individual and as a population and hopefully help decrease the rising rate of obesity that we're seeing right now in our country. So I'm very excited, as I said earlier to others, um, if I wasn't uh, the Dean and didn't have a little speaking role, I would have wanted to come and hear this talk anyway. So I'm gonna turn it now back to Chip to introduce uh, Dr. Gilbertson. Thank you, Dr. German. That, that was a terrific introduction to, for our guests. And I have to say, we've come so far. I interviewed for to come here in 2007. And uh, where the medical school is, even though I had an SUV, I, I darn near got stuck in the sand and the mud, which was pretty much all it was. So 
uh, uh, come a long way under your leadership in a short period of time. So without further ado, though, it's my pleasure to introduce you to our featured speaker, Dr. Timothy Gilbertson, who joined the College of Medicine as a professor of medicine in 2018. He has over 33 years of teaching experience. He started when he was about eight, and uh, as well as mentoring experience. And if you haven't had a chance to read his impressive bio, I think we're going to include a link for that as well in a follow-up email that we'll send to everybody. So without further ado, Dr. Gilbertson, thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, I would like to thank the College of Medicine, uh, Dean German, uh, the development office, particularly Chip Roberts, uh, Aaron Turner, uh, for getting me here tonight without too many snags. And, and I really appreciate the opportunity to share a little bit about what we're doing here at UCF. Uh, so I'd like to talk uh, tonight a little bit about our work in fat taste and what are some of the implications we think are important that may come out of this particular research program. I wanna start with a very simple question though. I wanna ask, why do we eat what we eat? Well, I'm not the first to ask this particular question. In fact, there was a really good study done uh, just a few years ago that looked at this for a whole bunch of different items. In fact, they wanted to know why people chose particular foods. And they looked at 87 specific items in 15 categories. And I'll sort of summarize their data here. And they use what we call a Likert scale, which means at one end on the one means they never eat for that reason. If it's seven, it means they always eat for that particular reason. So this shows you their 15 items and, and some of the individual uh, responses that people gave, right? It ranked everything from social image. They eat because others like that particular food. You see that this is a very low number, meaning rarely do people eat for this reason, right? Maybe they eat because they're interested in weight control. We eat that particular food because it's low in calories. Right, and we can go up and you can look at all these different 15 categories, right? They eat because it's fun to eat that particular item, maybe something like ice cream. But no matter how, when you go through this, there's always one reason that comes out at the top of this, right? And that reason is because it tastes good. That's the most common response, the highest rated response that everybody gives, right? They eat a particular food because it tastes good. So why do we taste? Why do we have a taste system? Why, why do we have this ability to recognize particular compounds uh, as, as particular taste modalities? Well, there's two main reasons we do this. One is we need to recognize the essential nutrients. What do I mean by that? Well, here I mean we have to be able to recognize those things in our diet that we need to survive. And a few of our basic tastes represent this property, right? Sweet or sweet taste is our ability to recognize carbohydrates. We have to have these in our diet for energy. Our salty taste is the recognition of minerals, things like sodium ions or potassium ions or calcium ions. We generally impart a salty taste when we encounter those in our food. There's another taste, maybe not so familiar to everyone, something called umami. This is a Japanese word meaning delicious. And this is a recognized uh, taste primer that allows us to recognize uh, the taste of amino, acid, of, of amino acids. Now in our culture, we would tend to call this flavor meaty or meaty salty. We don't have a unique word for it. But all of these have the common feature. Generally, they taste good to us. These are things we want to eat. They're pleasurable. But we have another role of taste, and it's equally important, and that is it has to uh, allow us to recognize things which are potentially poisonous or toxic to us. We think this is subserved primarily by our bitter taste system. So things like plant alkaloids, insect ven venoms, even pharmaceuticals, drugs that we might take have this pretty exquisite bitter profile. All of these generally we say taste bad. Now certainly we can overcome this, right? Many of us enjoy a cup of coffee in the morning and that um, by itself, if not adulterated with lots of cream and sugar, um, can taste bad or bitter. But we've come to learn to overcome that aversiveness maybe of bitter compounds because they have some positive effect, right? It wakes us up in the morning, it makes us alert. And we've come to associate that taste with that good feeling of alertness. So now that we know why we have a taste, how do we sense taste? How is taste recognized? Well, I'm gonna tell you a little bit of biology, a little bit of anatomy to start. This is the organ that we spend a lot of time working on. This is the tongue. And on the tongue, there are basically three regions which contain, contain organelles known as taste buds. They occur in the anterior tongue, along the sides, and then in the deep 
uh, back of the tongue. These are all taste buds. And one of the fallacies in taste that you may have seen is that there are certain tastes that are devoted to certain regions of the tongue. This is patently untrue. This is something, there's a very interesting story long ago about how this arose and I, I won't bother you with that tonight, but it's simply not true. So if you see that, you can tell your, your, your family or friends that no, sweet is not at the tip and bitter is not at the back. It's all over the tongue. Well, if we look at a cross section through a particular taste, but this is what we see. These are uh, anywhere from 50 to 150 cells per taste bud. They come in different types. They do different jobs. They all have specialized processes that reach into an area known as the taste pore. And it's at this taste pore that they interact with chemicals that come in when we decide to ingest something. So we begin to recognize those as particular taste modalities. And we know a lot, there's a lot of us that study taste. And over the past 10 to 20 years, we've learned a lot about how the basic tastes are detected. And I won't belabor this whole pathway, but just, just to say that for things like sweet, bitter, or umami, there are dedicated receptors present on your taste cells within that taste bud that respond to those particular chemicals. And it activates a signaling cascade. And the signaling cascade eventually produces a response where we release a chemical onto nerves that carry this information to your brain so that you have that perception of having tasted something sweet or bitter and you respond accordingly. I do want, don't want you to think that this is the organ, only organ that recognizes food in the body. There are these kinds of cells, these taste cells that are distributed all throughout our enteric nervous system, all throughout our digestive system, right? Not only are they in the tongue, we have olfactory receptors in the nasal epithelium that respond to some of the same chemicals, all down our epiglottis, our, our laryngeal areas, even our trachea has taste receptors that fulfill different roles. Some particularly important ones that are involved in maybe the control of food intake are in the stomach and the small intestine uh, respectively. But again, we always think about the conscious sense of taste in our tongue and our oral cavity, but we really can sense these foods all the way through as they travel through our body. I wanna turn the discussion a little bit to how I became interested initially in this idea of fat taste. And it all started with this idea of the epidemic of obesity that, that Dean German mentioned, right? If we look at what has been going on in this country over the past 20 to 30 years, we see some pretty dramatic changes. And what I'm gonna show you are data from the CDC, which shows you the percentage of a population in the United States that is considered obese. And obesity is simply a measure for these data of something known as the body mass index. This is simply a measure of weight over height. So if you're short and heavy, you're gonna have a high BMI, for example. So let's look at data from 1990, the first day, uh, year that I'll show you, though we have data that goes back farther. If we look at 1990, we see that most of the states certainly have less than 15% of the population as considered obese, right? We have lots of blue colors. Let's jump ahead 10 years. We see that the map has changed dramatically in one decade. Now we have states that have much higher proportions of, of individuals that are obese, right? We have all of these arise that now have as many as a quarter of the population are obese. Let's jump ahead 10 more years. And we see that the condition has gotten even more serious. Right, we now have states that have over a third of their population are considered obese. And obesity is linked with you know, a higher incidence of no less than 30 different diseases, things like cancer, things like metabolic syndrome, things like diabetes, are all have a higher incidence in obese individuals than those that are lean. So it's a real concern from the health perspective. If we jumped ahead 10 more years, you would see states now that show uh, as many as 40 to 45% of the entire population is considered obese. But there's one reason that I show you just this 20 year period. And one of the things that I want you to realize is that we as an organism don't evolve that fast, right? There's an idea which was thrown out a, a number of years ago, right? Which really captures this idea. And that is despite the fact that we know obesity has strong genetic determinants, the genetic composition of a population doesn't change this fast. It doesn't change within 20 years. We don't evolve. We haven't evolved to become fat in a, a two decade period. And that means that this large increase in obesity is due to some other factors, some major change in something not related 
to a genetic change, right? And this is a really important concept when we think, how do we battle this ongoing epidemic of obesity, right? A lot of our population now is obese. So what are the causes? What causes obesity? Well, we think there's several main causes when we talk about this, and us scientists like to use pie charts to demonstrate this sort of thing. And so if we look at um, some of the causes, one of the things that's been linked to obesity are genetic, actual genetic mutations. But we think this is a rather small part of the pie. Just a few percent of individuals who are obese are obese because they have some genetic mutation that predisposes them to be that way. Similarly, a relatively small percentage of individuals have a metabolic disorder. Right? Maybe they don't burn energy very well. They don't burn those calories very well, so they tend to store them as body fat. Actually, an increasingly large piece of the pie are socioeconomic factors. And if I drew this more to scale, this would be a, a much larger piece of the pie than I demonstrate here. And what do I mean by this? Well, I mean for many individuals who are on a limited budget, right? Particularly these days with a pandemic going on, many people have lost their jobs. You don't have a lot of extra spending money. And it's much cheaper in these cases where money is a constraint to eat your calories at the McDonald's, right? To go to the dollar menu, you get a lot more calories per dollar eating at McDonald's than you do going to Publix and trying to buy lean meat, fresh fruits, and vegetables. It's simply a matter of economy. But no matter how we want to slice our pie, no matter how we divvy it up, the biggest problem we believe is it's a, it's a problem of choice. It's a lifestyle choice. You know, sometimes when I give talks, I'll say, for the price of admission, I'm going to give you the cure to obesity. And that cure is simple. Eat less, exercise more. That's it. That's the cure. So it seems that this choice that we make to eat too much and exercise too little is driving a lot of the obesity that we think is going on uh, during this, this last 20 year period or so. So I said, it's a problem of choice. Well, it seems that one of the uh, things that we need to realize is this idea of an energy balance equation. Right? It's food intake over energy expenditure. It's calories in over calories out. Right? At its root, it almost becomes that simple. We can't cheat this equation. We can't cheat it, no matter what we do. There is no thigh cream that you could rub on your legs to cause you to lose body fat. Right? It's simply this. Right? If you want to lose weight, you need to be in what we call negative energy balance. Okay? You need right, to burn more calories through activity, through your exercise, through your basal metabolism, than you take in in a day. Conversely, if you wanna go in the other way, me as an individual, I'm constantly in positive energy balance. I tend to take in more calories than I expend. I'm going to gain weight. And it doesn't have to be a lot of calories. It's been estimated as few as 100 calories per day in positive energy balance can cause you to gain five or 10 pounds in a year. If you've ever seen a 100 calorie snack pack, you know that that's not a lot of calories, okay? And as much as we would like to cheat this equation, we really can't. So what's the problem? Well, I said it's a problem of choice. And it seems that one of the bad choices that we make that's leading us down this road is a choice to eat a high fat diet. These are rather old data, I think from 1990 or so, uh, from Bray and Popkin, which show you the percentage of energy in different countries or cultures that they take in from fat and the representing BMI um, over 25% on the y-axis. Here, a BMI of 25% means you're overweight or obese. What do we see? Well, we see that there's a nice linear relationship between those cultures that take in more energy from fat and those that have a greater percentage of the population that are overweight and obese. And here's our, our good old country, the USA. We have some of the highest rates of fat intake and some of the highest rates of being obese and overweight. If we look at the last 20 year period or so since these data were taken, we are now sitting at about 70% of our population is overweight. And we take in about 42% of our, our, our calories from dietary fat. So this seems to be a pretty poor choice we make. Well, why do we do that? Well, I'll tell you, we have an innate preference in our diet for fat. We like fat. All animals like fat. Well, why do they do that? Well, it's the most energy-dense nutrient that you can encounter. 
right? Nine kcals per gram, over twice as much as for sugars or carbohydrates and protein. So from an evolutionary perspective, it's really good to have this preference for fat. And it's really good to eat a lot of dietary fat, right? Because as we evolved and became hunter gatherers, we had to work pretty hard for our calories, right? And this idea was coined uh, the thrifty gene hypothesis by Neil way back in the 60s. And it basically says that natural selection favors the survival of those individuals who could store as many calories as possible, then burn them as slowly as possible. This is what you wanted. You wanted to get fat because you're going to survive a lot longer if you're a hunter gatherer than somebody who's thin and doesn't store a lot of energy. But now we have a problem. Now we have a problem. And that is our times have changed but our genes don't catch up so fast. Right now, we have a Publix every few blocks. We have a Burger King or a McDonald's on every second or third corner. Calories are no longer limited to us, but we evolved under that constraint where we wanted to store fat. We wanted to burn it slowly. We wanted to eat as much as we, we could. So we think in many ways, our genes are working against us in that regard. So we said, why do we eat what we eat? Right? We learned at the beginning, well, because it tastes good. That's the predominant reason that people eat. Right? I know it's true for me. Right? So I wanted to ask the question, was there a taste of fat? You may think that's a strange question. We eat because it tastes good. And, and I know personally that fat tastes good. Right? So why, do, why bother to do science? Why do things that, that seem to be unnecessary? Well, we got into trying to answer this question you know, from a scientific perspective, because we knew that this organ's job, at least in one part, as we talked about, is to recognize nutrients. And so now about 20 years ago or so, I tried to answer this question, well, if our, our taste system should recognize nutrients, can it recognize the essential fatty acids? These are important constituent of our diet. If you don't realize that some fats we have to have every day in order to be at our optimum physiologically. Some are required in our diet in order to survive. We call these the essential fatty acids. So I asked the question, can we detect these essential fatty acids? Do they somehow activate those taste cells? I'm going to tell you, obviously, the answer is yes, or I probably wouldn't have a job and I probably wouldn't be here talking to you today because that would have failed miserably. But it's true. And if I come back to this, this diagram where I said there's dedicated receptors for, for example, sweet, bitter, and umami, I'm going to put it up again to illustrate a point. And that is when we do this kind of work, and we are cellular neurophysiologists by training in my lab, we look at a couple of hallmarks of cell activation, right? Common in this pathway, if I was to put a sweet compound on a taste receptor cell that could respond to sweet, we would see a couple of changes. One, we would see a what we call membrane depolarization. You don't have to know what this means other than to say, this is just the accumulation of positive charge or positive ions inside the cell. All cells that get activated do this. Every cell in your body does this. Right? It also does another thing, and that is it increases the, the concentration of an ion known as calcium. So we've called calcium the ubiquitous second messenger. Virtually in all cells that get activated by some stimulus, we see these two things, a membrane depolarization and a rise in calcium. So as cellular biologists, we can measure these things in cells. So we can take taste cells and ask that question, do these fatty acids, do these essential fatty acids activate taste cells? And they do. Right here shows you some data. This is showing the calcium imaging data where we're monitoring calcium ions inside cells. And here's our before we stimulate with a fatty acid and act, after we stimulate, we load them with a particular dye that senses calcium. And you see that some of the cells with arrowheads here turn from a green to a red. The warmer the colors means the higher the calcium. We can look at the concentration response function for this kind of thing. This is important if we want to know if we're dealing with a response um, to concentrations that we normally find. And these concentrations match the concentration of linoleic acid, for example, that we normally find in the body. Uh, this just shows you that we can see this change in membrane potential or membrane depolarization as well. If we take a cell and put on a fatty acid, that membrane potential, what we say depolarize, or that cell becomes activated. But it's not just the essential fatty acids, as we've learned very recently. Even the saturated fatty acids seem to have their own dedicated receptors. These are the so-called evil fats. 
those that we really don't want in our diet because they have a lot more serious consequences to our health when in, ingested in large amounts. So things like the saturated fatty acid, capric acid, elicits a calcium change in these cells. It elicits a membrane depolarization in these cells. So both saturated and unsaturated fatty acids are capable of activating the taste system. We would say that there's a taste of fat. As you can imagine, we and others really explored this in some detail since we initially found these, these uh, seminal observations. And we've really worked out the pathway for how these fats are detected. And this is sort of ongoing research um, as well. And it's important for us to do this, not because we like the minutiae associated with cells, but we wanna know what are the receptors for these compounds? What are the proteins that are involved in the signaling for these compounds? Because maybe they give us a, a clue as to how we can eventually uh, target this epidemic of obesity. Well, I'll tell you, since these times, um, we're coming to, and, and some grudgingly perhaps, are coming to the conclusion that indeed fat taste might re represent a sixth taste primer. So in addition to salty, sour, sweet, bitter, and umami, which most of us can easily say, we're starting to provide data that suggests that fat itself is this now six taste modality. This is actually from a review from my major professor when I was a postdoc. And after we had done years of work on this, he wrote a review on taste and he, he begrudgingly sort of admitted that maybe fat had something, but he wasn't willing to put this piece of the pie all the way in. And I never ever have let him forget that for writing that review. I will say in the 10 years since he wrote this review, we now have hammered this piece of pie pretty much all the way in and it's re relatively well accepted that fat again has its own taste modality. Okay, but why has this been a problem? Why historically don't we in our culture talk about fat like we talk about the other tastes? I, I could ask everybody in this audience to name me the basic taste and I guarantee everybody would say salty, sour, sweet and bitter. And maybe if you're in the know a little bit, you might even recognize umami if you, you've traveled abroad. But why don't we talk about fat in this way? Well, I don't know the answer to that for sure. Maybe it's a cultural thing, but we know that fat can activate the taste system. But maybe the reason is fat is rarely eaten by itself. Right? So maybe that understanding the sensory aspects of fat perception is only really relevant to us in the context of other taste stimuli. I don't know the answer to that, but this is something that we've thought since we long first got into this, this project dealing with uh, the sensory cues for dietary fat. Well, maybe we have some ideas uh, surrounding this. If you look to the food and flavor industry, um, Harold Moskowitz is, is a very renowned figure in, in uh, design of, of food, right, and food products. And he coined this term, the bliss point, the bliss point. What is it? Well, we define the bliss point as the amount of an ingredient such as salt, sugar, or fat, or combinations therein that optimize its deliciousness, right? Food companies want to sell product. So they use this idea of the bliss point very, very, um, they take this very seriously. What do we mean by that? Well, for, for example, if we talk about a food that's primarily fat and sweet, there's some combination of fat and sweet, which gets us to the optimal pleasure for that product. It tastes the best. And why do we eat? We eat because things taste good. So food companies want to know the bliss point for various mixtures. Interestingly, when we talk about bliss point or people in the food industry talk about bliss point, it's generally only in the context of sweet fat mixtures or salt fat mixtures. So things maybe like ice cream or cake frosting or things like salt and fat combinations like chips, pizza, other things like that that have that they look for the bliss point of that, right? If we can match that. So there is this idea, again, that fat may be important, not as its own unique taste, because we don't tend to eat fat alone, but in how it combines with other stimuli. Okay, so we've talked about fat, we've talked about this idea of the obesity epidemic. Do, does any of this information that we're looking at in the taste system or in any other areas, and all of these other areas I will tell you without showing you the data, have these same pathways that I'm talking about from those derived from the tongue. Can we get any information from this that shows that these pathways have something to do with fat intake, right? That's why I was in initially interested in the taste of fat was how can we use this information to maybe help uh, in the battle against this epidemic of obesity? 
well, I'm just redrawing this uh, transduction pathway, the signaling pathway for the essential fatty acid thing is to illustrate a point. One of the ways we can do that is through genetic manipulation in our animals, right? We wanna ask the question, is this receptor important for somehow determining how much fat an animal prefers or how much fat an animal will eat? Well, we can go in and genetically silence particular genes that we're interested in. This is rather routine in science these days. Right? And so we can take out the receptor. We can take out one of those things that releases calcium. We can take out one of the channels that depolarizes that cell, those metrics of cell activation, right? And I'll show you data on just one of them. They'll say we see similar effects if we knock out other proteins in this same pathway. If we look at the loss of one of these, this, this is a channel known as TRIPM5. This gives us that change in membrane potential or depolarization, I said, is a hallmark of cell activation. If we take it out in animals, what do we do? And we did this in mice. We just took out this gene so they never had it. Mice ate less fat. And I'll show you what, what that means right here. Here we have them on a controlled diet. This is not something you would want to be on. It's a low 4% fat diet. Probably doesn't taste particularly really well to these animals. And then we're going to switch them to a high fat diet. Well, what do you notice? This WT means wild type. This is our normal, non-genetically modified animal. When we do that in this animal, we see that it eats a lot of the control diet, right? It's taking more in every day. It's just cumulative intake of food. If we switch it to a high fat diet, we notice the slope of this changes means, ah, you got something good. He's eating at a faster rate. He's eating more. But in those mice where we knock this gene out, they don't show that change. They eat less than the animals that have this particular channel. As you can imagine, these mice also weighed less and they had less body fat. Right. Simple, they ate less, they, get, they gained less weight, they have less fat on their body. I will tell you, when we first saw these data, we were enormously excited, enormously excited, because we thought, hey, there's a, a target for us, we can look at this TRIPM channel, can we use it for the control of fat intake, right? Because if I somehow interfere with this channel, that, that, that organism is going to eat 20% less fat. It's going to get quite a bit less fat through its own free living um, environment, right? These animals have access to all the food that they could ever want, okay? Well, I, I didn't tell you one thing. And when we did these initial experiments, they were done in, in all male mice. That's fine in taste we often have, in science in general, we've often been pretty myopic and only looked at males uh, for understanding physiology. Okay, and that's, that's to our, much to our disadvantage because when we did this experiment in females, despite our initial excitement, we didn't see the same effect. We saw something very different, okay? And that is even knocking out this channel we know is important for fat detection, it didn't make an ounce of difference to the female mice. They ate the same amount, they still gained the same amount of weight, they put on the same amount of body fat whether they had this channel or not. So we said, oh, maybe this channel is not so important in, in the control. But it did lead us down another avenue in my research program. So I'll change gears yet again and say, are there sex differences in taste or are there sex differences in fat taste? Because certainly there's something else going on. when We looked at the role of this particular fatty acid signaling pathway in the control of intake. So I'll show you data from a behavioral assay that we did to sort of test this idea, are males and females different? This is something known as the condition taste aversion, where we test the relative responsiveness to a taste stimulus. It's, it's a rather simple idea. And that is we give an animal a novel stimulus, something they've never encountered before. So in this case, we're gonna give them a fatty acid. Soon as we give them that fatty acid, we're gonna inject them with something. We're gonna inject them with a, a salt known as lithium chloride. This makes the animal ill. So the same thing as if you went to a restaurant and ate a food and, and you got food poisoning, you're probably not gonna to wanna to go back to that restaurant the next night, right? You develop an aversion. This can last years. This is the most powerful form of learning that we know about. So we did this in animals. We either injected them with lithium chloride to make them sick or with sodium chloride as a control. Let's just look at what we call the sham females. This is just our regular old females. When we did this experiment, we made them ill to linoleic acid, one of our fatty acids. And what do we see? Well, after we go into testing, we see that they drink 
fatty acid at a variety of concentrations, right? And it's because they're water deprived, they want to drink. So they drink at a very high rate, the normal animals. Those that we made ill though, avoid drinking the fatty acid. This means it has a taste. These are very short-term acids. In fact, we can use this to estimate the sensitivity of that animal for the compound when it first recognizes it. So even down to something like 0.3 micromolar, this female, these female mice avoid that compound that made them ill. If we compare it to males, we see males can do the same thing. They can avoid the fatty acid, but it takes higher concentrations. So we can say that females are simply more sensitive to fatty acid than males. And this holds up time and time again. Well, we did another experiment in this, and that is we overectomized females. We took out their ovaries and asked, did this have any effect? Since we were seeing a male and female difference, the easiest thing we could look for were sex hormones as possible causes of this. So we took out the ovaries of females, and lo and behold, they became really insensitive to fatty acids. They could only avoid fatty acid now at almost a thousand times the concentration that they did initially. So it seems somehow this loss of, of this sex hormone, estrogen, caused them to become more male-like. And we know that this occurs in women after entering menopause, right? They tend to put on body fat in different regions, more similar to men. They tend to put on a lot more fat than they did initially, and so on. And we can reverse this in our animals. We can give them estrogen. So it just means estradiol benzoate. We can give them estrogen and restore this sensitivity. So this led us to saying, wow, we have sex differences. They're somehow related to the sex hormones. So we asked, was it estrogen somehow working in that pathway that we've been talking about? And so I'll show you a little bit of data to suggest that in, indeed that is true. Here we just compared uh, mice, my cycle, female mice cycle every four days, they go through their, their estrous cycle. So we picked a period where uh, es estrogen was high and a period where estrogen was low and we collected cells from these, these, these female mice and asked what happens. Well, in the conditions when estrogen is low, they're very responsive to estrogen. Here's our fatty acid response. I think you'll agree not knowing much that it's bigger, even not knowing much, it's bigger when we put estrogen on. So that restoration of that response we saw, we think is due to estrogen working actually at the level of the taste receptor cell. You might be surprised to know or not that males also have estrogen receptors. They also respond to estrogen in just the same way. We just don't have a lot of circulating estrogen around. But those during the period when estrogen is high, when here we collected the cells, are not as responsive, meaning these cells are already, whatever that change is, are already primed and responsing at a maximum level, even without estrogen present. So there are sex effects uh, in taste, um, and it works ap apparently by, uh, at least in part, by enhancing this responsiveness to fatty acids. Okay, I'll finish up with sort of talking about this question again. Why do we eat what we eat? We said because it tastes good. Well, I'm gonna talk about this a very simple principle that we think uh, impacts this idea and maybe how we can play into this epidemic ob obesity as we go forward. This is the role of negative feedback. And when I used to teach introductory biology before I came to UCF to thousands of undergraduates, I always showed this slide to illustrate this principle, right? We all understand this, right? Your home has a thermostat. You, you're comfortable at a certain temperature, right? So you might set that temperature at 72 degrees. If it gets below that particular uh, temperature, maybe as it did a couple of nights ago in Orlando, right, we get cool. Our heater goes on, it produces heat, the room temperature increases to get us back to that comfort level. Right. It goes above because the heater's on. Well, now it's gotten too high. We need to turn the heater off. No heat's produced. The room temperature starts to decrease. And there's this beautiful interplay between on and off with the heater to keep us at our set point. Well, we think the same thing occurs with food intake. Right? When we eat, when we choose to eat, right? that information in that food has particular sensory properties. We've been talking a lot about uh, taste, but it has texture. It has other sensory properties, smell as well. Well, these sensory properties contribute to that activation of the pleasure reward, reward centers of the brain, right? This is why we eat, because it tastes good. It activates those same centers in the brain that are activated, for example, by many uh, drugs that people choose to take, right? This is a reward center. Well, at some point, though, enough is enough. Right? Maybe you hit what we can consider a set point for that particular 
uh, food, no matter how much you maybe like pizza or how much you might like pie in this case, mm -hmm. right? At some point, you're going to become satiated with that. We've all had this experience. Maybe you've eaten too much sweet. What's, what do you crave? Uh, maybe something salty. So we like this idea of the set point for these pathways involving this pleasurable relationship of, of uh, food intake. Well, how do we make use of that information? As I said, we've elucidated this fat pathway, we believe. We know the receptors, we know how, they, how this works. So we wanted to compare, compare animals that were either lean or obese. Okay. We know we have at particular animals that are very sensitive to dietary fat or those that are less sensitive or insensitive to dietary fat. Remember, women tend to be more sensitive to fat than men. So we think there's parallels to what's going on as well. So what does it mean? Well, as for our lean animal, they're very sensitive to the sensory properties in fat. So we get a strong signal to the tongue. The strong signals carry to the brain. It shuts off intake much earlier than it would for another organism. Right? So we think of this negative feedback pathway, this thermostat now for the control of food intake. Conversely, the obese animal right, is, has a weaker stimulation. It's not as res responsive to the cues in the dietary fat. So it eats more to get to that same pleasurable set point. So it eats more and eats more and eats more until finally it's reached its satiation point. But by that point, it's eaten more fat. It's taken in more calories. It's putting on uh, more body weight. So this is what we think is going on with these negative feedback pathways and the control of food intake. Um, in fact, we did a really interesting experiment. We took genetically lean mice, or rats in this case, an uh, experiment we did quite a while ago, and looked at them. These are actually two brothers. One that we put on a normal diet. We did this lots and lots of times. And on a normal diet, mm -hmm. he, a normal diet, he weighed about 200 grams. His brother, who we put on a high fat diet for two months, ballooned up to 368 grams. And the only difference between these animals really is, is, is body fat. Okay. So you can imagine what we wanted to do. We wanted to say, did something change in our signaling pathway, how that animal recognized dietary fat? So we measured changes genetically, at the cell level, behaviorally. What we found was even this genetically lean mice on a high fat diet showed changes. It became more like an obesity prone animal. It was much less responsive to the sensory cues. It had a much greater preference for fat. So we could overcome this by feeding them a high fat diet. And I'll tell you, this occurred very fast, these changes. Within three days on a high fat diet, even though it hadn't become fat yet, we started to see changes in this pathway. You can guess what we did next. We put them on a diet. We said, hey, you've gotten fat. We're going to reduce your, your fat intake and put you on a low fat diet, back to a 4% diet. And we waited 60 days, let him eat as much as he wanted, but on a low fat diet. He didn't recover this change in sensitivity. He didn't recover any uh, overt changes in preference. We even extended it to 120 days. This is like me putting on you on a diet for seven years, okay? And he didn't recover that sensory cue, that sensory property change. So in some ways we think our sensory world works against us. And maybe that's because of evolutionary pressure like we talked about, that that change to keep eating a high fat diet once we encounter it is very strong because that'll keep us alive a lot longer. But changing it back is more difficult. It doesn't mean that diets don't help. It doesn't mean that they don't work, but we have to think of them again in this idea of the energy balance equation, right? What does every diet have in common? It reduces caloric intake, but it also has a, a disclaimer telling you to exercise more because it realizes that that's an equally important component. So what do we do with all of this kind of information that, that comes out of my lab? Well, we think it's important, not just for mat, right, uh, rats and mice, we think there's a human correlate as well. And this is something we're very interested in. Obviously, we might want to use pharmacological approaches to control fat intake, right? Like that TRIP-M5 channel, at least in males, right? If we can target that, maybe we can meet, get individuals to eat less fat. We want to develop fat substitutes in the same way that we develop substitutes for sweet, like stevia, uh, saccharin, and so on. We can use this information, knowing these fat receptors, to develop fat substitutes which are acceptable to the consumer. Give us the same sensory pleasure without those adverse effects of eating a high fat diet. Well, we also are really interested in this idea of what kinds of specific diets 
lead us down that road to obesity? What kind of specific diets or compounds make our sensing system change more than others? Can we then use this information to make rational uh, recommendations to the population about how they should eat, right? And along this line, how specific idea diets alter this, this nutrient recognition pathway? Something I'm really interested in is can we shift that bliss point? Right? We want Food companies still want to sell their product, but maybe we can somehow trick that taste system into being satisfied with less fat in that ratio, but still have that same pleasure from the product, okay? And really we're interested in something that um, I think about quite a lot these days are this idea of development of sex specific foods. We know lots of anecdotes out there of foods that men prefer that women don't like and or that women like and men don't prefer like barbecue chips is an example i always talk about men typically are drawn to these women generally don't like them at all so i would really be interested in to develop this idea use this information that we're starting to emerge from differences between male and female taste and they are significant to design specific products marketed toward males or females and along these lines, I didn't talk much about diet, but we see differences in dieting success in our male and female mice that lead us to certain ideas of certain products that might aid one sex or the other in developing uh, successful dieting. So with that, I'll end, and I do want to spend a minute just to acknowledge people that have done lots of work in my lab, both at, in Utah and since I moved to UCF, particularly these five hardy individuals which made the trek uh, from the mountains uh, down to the flatlands of Florida with me and, uh, and are still with me working in my lab, who've been really important to our, our, any success that we've had. I would like to thank funding sources from NIH and a number of food and flavor companies over the year. And, and a, a special thank you uh, to the Martin Anderson, Gracia Anderson Foundation for supporting a lot of, of my efforts um, after coming to, to you, uh, UCF. And so with that, I'll, I will thank you and be happy to take any questions you might have. Thank you, Dr. Gilbertson. It was fascinating. I think we're going to go ahead and start the question and answer section, as you said. Uh, but first, a couple of things. Um, Aaron Turner is going to be adding the UCF MedTalk welcome letter to the chat window, which you can find at the bottom of the Zoom window if you click on chat. And I believe that is very important if you want to get CME credit. So if you want to go ahead and download that from the chat window, feel free to do so. Also, we do encourage you to join the conversation directly. Go to the bottom of the Zoom window and you'll see a little button that says participants. If you click on that participants button, the participants window will appear. And at the bottom of that window, you can go ahead and click raise your hand. And I'll be glad to call on you so you can unmute and join the conversation. So I've got my first question through chat, and it is the following. You did not touch on the carbohydrate-rich diet that causes obesity. No, and I purposely say most of our research focuses really on fat intake. Um, and again, if you, if you think about the energy balance equation, it honestly doesn't matter where those calories are coming from at least for many of us that, that work in, in nutrition, right? It's, it's more of an argument of calories in and calories out. And we think particularly for children, carbohydrates are notoriously bad. That's because they're drawn to these, these very high sucrose uh, sodas, uh, very drawn to candy, which are incredibly high in calories, but those calories are coming from carbohydrate. I would argue that there's not a huge difference um, between obesity that develops from fat or carbohydrate and we don't mean to sort of minimize that in our discussion tonight, but frankly, our work in fat, and so we're trying to understand that particular aspect because of its correlation with, uh, with its increased in intake and the obesity epidemic. But it is equally a big problem, I agree. Thank you. Next we have, can you give me a reference that will expand on particular taste differences between sexes? Um, you mean, uh, well, there, there's actually surprisingly been very little done in taste and sexes. Um, by our count, um, there's probably been about a dozen manuscripts that looked at the cellular and molecular differences or behavioral differences in mice or even humans with respect to the sexes. So it's relatively new in our field. And this is really interesting. Um, I will tell you that those of us in the field of taste, as I said, myopically have long been drawn to studying males. And, 
And we did this not because of any inherent bias, but we know in our experiments, males tend to be incredibly stable in their responses, right? So that we can record from a male animal at any day, at any time, and he's always gonna give us the same response. Our data looks really nice. It's not very variable. When we do the same experiments on females, they're incredibly variable. And so, uh, we, we've often in the field for a long time just focused on males to try and understand basic mechanisms because the variability in the female data with my cycling so fast every four days, it was, it was overwhelming our, our data. But about, I don't know, five, six, seven years ago, NIH said, stop, you can't do that any longer. You can't just study males. You have to give equal um, uh, attention to females. And so those of us that, that uh, we're doing this work, then began to explore females. And here we were seeing really big differences. So I'd say it's relatively new and maybe why we haven't seen a lot of publications. We have some coming out and there are a few in the literature that talk about male-female differences in salt taste, for example, that, uh, that have been around for a few years as well. So it is out there. Thank you. Um, and before we move on to our next question, uh, Jay Charles, did you have a question for us? No, I just wanted to comment that uh, there is a definite difference uh, between male and female in barbecue. Uh, between my love of barbecue and some, uh, she, it's okay. <laughs> Yeah, and, and, and we could probably go through the audience and talk about lots of personal uh, differences that, that people have noticed. I, I absolutely agree, you know, that there are differences and they've just largely been ignored. I, I'm really interested in this actually. And I, I know people a lot of times think I'm joking, but this idea of specific products for males and females, you know, I need to go down to Publix and uh, tell them that they need to support research so we can come up with products that they can sell that are gonna be really attractive to one sex or the other. Because we're finding the Taste worlds are really different. Thank you. This is Dr. Swika. Um, when you consider bariatric surgery, does bariatric surgery alter any of these pathways? And then the other question to that part is, can somehow your research couple with bariatric surgery to increase uh, and improve their results in terms of that, that, that's a great question. I, I will say people have looked at that pretty extensively in, in our field of taste. And they do find, because when they have bariatric surgery, a lot of signaling molecules are, are greatly reduced in, in their expression. Things that are important, hormones and things which are important for the control of food intake as well. And we know that most of these hormones that affect food intake also affect the taste system as well. So I will say actually there's a fairly rich literature on bariatric surgery and taste, and there are changes that occur. Uh, and I think people are looking at just like you, you um, hypothesize, what, what's the nature of these changes and can now somehow we understand those differences and use that to sort of control subsequently food intake so that you don't develop obesity again. I think this is an area I'll plead a little bit of ignorance around that I don't work on specifically, but I will say there are people that are really interested in that question. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so one of the questions that came in through our chat, do you think that this work, given the differences between the sexes, will eventually lead to different diets? Um, yeah, I would think so. I mean, I would hope so. I mean, we're really finding when we feed it, male versus female rodents, different diets, they respond physiologically very differently, right? And I know I talked about calories in and calories out, but I'm talking about really this idea of control of food intake in this regard, in that the, the things that turn off that desire to eat are different for males and females for different nutrients. And this is one of the things that we would like to explore. Can we recommend diets that have a good bliss point that are attracted to consumers so that people are gonna be satisfied with eating less, right? And it may be different for males and females. We're only at the very beginning of this kind of research, um, but, uh, but I hope to, I, I certainly hope someday that it really comes to that point where we can make recommendations, which are not just for the general population based only on male data, but on data from both sexes. And it may be quite different. And I think we're seeing this in many areas of physiology these days as well. And a follow-up to that is, can, do you think you could outline some specific differences in what that diet might look like? I know, uh, obviously, you've pointed out the differences in, in, the, in the fatty acids, but um, is there any, any indication from your work what the differences in those diets would be? 
Um, honestly, at this point, no, and it would be really premature for me. Even you know, we've only done very rudimentary studies, and I would sort of hate, since I know this is being recorded, uh, to to be pushed in a particular corner and say, yeah, well, women should eat this this particular carbohydrate, and that's going to you know cause uh, lower weight gain. I, I just don't have those data yet. But I mean, maybe if you invite me back in in a year or two to to give an update, we'll have some more of that specific information at that time. It's just a little premature. We're, we're, this is a really new area for us. Another question we've got here, and I'm going to pronounce this the best way I can. Uh, Ayurveda calls astrogen the sixth taste. Is there any relationship between astrogen and fat tastes, or do you know? Um, yeah, astringents are, are a really weird sort of chemical, right? These are things which dry out, and we really don't know at all how these are detected. We we're not sure if this is taste or if this is also another system in our tongue known as the somatosensory or texture-based system. Certainly we know astringent compounds as well um, are recognized by the body. We can I can give you an astringent compound and you can tell me, well, that's that's you know some certain sensory attribute. You might give it a different name than I would give it, but you would certainly recognize it. And again, one of the things that we've learned over the years, and it's really been difficult to, to sort of get the field to accept, is there's things beyond these five basic tastes. And I've always said it's because our field of taste, we're lumpers. We want to fit everything that activates our taste system into one of those initial five categories. Right? If we talk about the olfactory system, we talk about them as talking about every different odorant as a different sort of sensory modality. And I think it's just the, the nature of our, our field at, at this point in time. There are many things. There's so-called calcium taste. We have a, a unique ability that seems to be separate from all the other taste modalities for the detection of calcium. So, I mean, while I talk about fat as the sixth taste, maybe I'm tooting my own horn, but there's probably a dozen or more different identifiable taste constructs that we look at these days, including astringency, including things like menthol or aromatic compounds, including things, as I said, like calcium. So we need to broaden our goal a little bit, our insight a little bit, I think, in the field of taste to include these, what we call the non-conventional tastes. Thank you. And can you speak to why you might feel that the Atkins diet works for some people? Is Atkins success still about calorie calorie energy balance yeah and i know you could talk to you know dozens of people you know maybe in the audience today that all had success on different diets i had tremendous success 15 years ago on the south beach diet you know the one where we restrict not unlike the atkins diet where you restrict carbohydrate intake um do i believe personally that there's any big difference in diets i would say in the broad term no, though I'm certainly not an expert in nutrition and dieting per se. Um, I, I do believe that the most controlling factor is this idea of energy balance, calories in and calories out. I think that any diet that is recommended makes you aware of the calories you take in, right? You're more conscious of what you're eating. You're not just eating for that pleasure of taste anymore. You're thinking, okay, I've got to eat so much carbohydrate in the diet. I've got to restrict fat or I've got to eat a lot of fat and restrict carbohydrate, right? I think we're just, for me, I think when I'm on a diet, I know personally, my anecdote is I'm more conscious of the calories in. But every diet also is paired with this increase in energy expenditure. Every diet tells you to exercise. And it's not that the diet itself doesn't work, the reduction in calories, but they want to, you know, get the more bang for your buck by increasing that energy expenditure part as well. So whether you believe in, you know, uh, the paleo diet or the South Beach diet or the Atkins diet, I think they all work by making us more aware of the calories in and this idea of, of balancing that with exercise. One of the problems with diets is they all pretty much fail at some point when you want to get off that diet. And we think because you ate a particular nutrient for a long period of time, you've changed your sensing world, right? To get to that set point of how much you, you need to eat to get to, to that pleasurable set point, that changed once and it doesn't change back very easily. So you really have to redouble your efforts um, to increase the exercise when you come off a diet, those kinds of things to keep that weight off. Thank you. Just, we it, have... 
Yeah, it, it doesn't ahead. mean it doesn't mean, for example, that maybe different nutrients are dealt with in different ways by the body, and there may be certain people burn fat better than they burn carbohydrates, and different people burn carbohydrates. There's certainly individual differences, but I think as a population, we were really stuck on that energy balance equation. Thank you. And I think for our last question, which is a good one, because it's related to something we're all talking about right now, and that is, do you feel like you can offer us something regarding the loss of taste that is reported with COVID? Does that yeah, loss of taste cause people to gain or lose weight, or do you know? That, that's a great question. People are looking at that. It's a little too early to say. I will say that we know that um, why the taste there is taste loss with COVID. It express, we know the particular proteins that COVID uses to hijack its way into your cells, right? So that that virus can replicate and make more of itself and infect more cells and, and damage your tissues. Well, it turns out that taste cells and the cells in your olfactory system, your sense of smell, express really large amounts of those proteins that COVID uses to hijack its way into the body. Uh, one of the things I didn't tell you about taste, and this is true of smell as well, it's a unique part of the nervous system. These cells turn over very rapidly. Your taste cells only live about 10 days. Now, most neurons in your body, in the central nervous system, live forever. You're born with those neurons. They survive throughout the rest of your life. Taste cells turn over very rapidly. Right? So we think what happens with COVID is these viruses get in, they kill particular cells, particularly the stem cells that renew this taste cell population, and they don't allow these cells to turn over very well. So you don't have very many left. Those that are there don't function very well. Well, I would argue that one of the, the outcomes, if you listen to what we, we talked about in detail tonight, you, this is a very good question, though we don't know the answer to it yet, I would love to know, is that since COVID is reducing our sense of taste, are we now going to eat more to get to that pleasurable sensation? Are we going to just overeat? Is an increase in obesity going to be one of the other outcomes of having a population that's had its taste and smell system disturbed by COVID? And how fast does it recover? And does it ever recover? Those are great questions. And I know lots of really good scientists are doing just that kind of work right now. But this is a really hot topic. You know, it's one of the few times that taste research came into the really the forefront of, of uh, medical and physiological research. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Gilbertson. It's been fascinating. Uh, I think we've reached the end of our question and answer portion. So I'm going to go ahead and toss it back to Mr. Chip Roberts. Go ahead and take it away. Great. Thank you. I'm unmuted. Great. Um, so First of all, <laughs> well, the script here says, let's have a round of applause for Dr. Gilbertson. I don't know, you know, I, I think we can see it. We maybe can't hear it, but <laughs> thank you so much, Dr. Gilbertson. That, that is, uh, that's enlightening. And unfortunately it makes me want to go eat a bag of barbecue potato chips, but that's it, that's it, it is what it is. So I wanna thank you for our guests, our guests for joining us. We look forward to doing future events like this. And, you know, we vary the topics, so uh, we'll move around and hit various topics and throughout experts and uh, uh, within the college. Um, and I'd like to mention just real quick, behind the scenes and not so behind the scenes, Erin uh, Turner, who did not write her name in here, but is the driving force for these events. Uh, she really is, and she's done the vast amount, vast majority of the work to put these on and make them successful. Um, thank you, Dr. German, for taking time. I know how busy your schedule is uh, to do this and always being there. Um, I'd like to thank also Ryan Rutherford. Uh, thank you, our extraordinary moderator, and our, our, yes, and for the Q&A period, Michael Reeves behind the scenes for producing it and a whole bunch of other people probably. So following our event, thank you, Dr. Gilbertson, again. Really, I know... Uh, I know uh, it's an extraordinary work you're doing and, and it's been supported by the community and supported by the highest, uh, you know, uh, highest scientific uh, uh, agencies in the land. And uh, I, I'm just confident that you're gonna solve the problem and I'm gonna lose those pounds. So Chip, I'm gonna jump in here. And Dr. Okay. Gilbertson, when you make those discoveries and it sounds like you're on the verge in the next year or two, please let us know. We wanna invite you back right away so that we can all learn what we should and shouldn't do mm -hmm. 
to maintain a, 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 a normal and an ideal weight. We want you back to tell us that, okay? Well, when you see me get skinny, invite me. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you to, to our guests. So following the event, you're gonna receive an email with more information about the College of Medicine and ways, if you wish, that you can become involved, of course. Um, you know, we also, if you're interested in learning even more about Dr. Gilbertson's work or perhaps being in some way involved through support of one way or another, just let us know. We've provided a lot of contact information. We're delighted that you joined us. You've spent the time to, to, to learn and to share or to share in this knowledge with us. And uh, please keep a lookout for the next one, which will be after the holidays. I don't know exactly when, um, but we're, we're really excited for whatever that next event will be. Have a wonderful evening. We appreciate your support, your friendship, and look forward to seeing you soon. Have a very, very happy holidays. And thank you. Good night, everyone. Thank Good night. you. Good night. Good night.